My Paphiopedalum dillonatii and I managed to hitch a ride on this care collab for specifically Paphiopedalum dillonatii together with Fernanda Nacimiento orchids and succulents and attainable green. Thank you ladies for letting me jump on board on the care collab that you guys were planning. I really appreciate it. Scooted in, not really last minute because what I do appreciate about these care collabs is that they're being planned way in advance. So, but I do appreciate you letting me hop on board and show you my Paphiopedalum delinatii, which I grow in Lekka and self-watering. Now you see all the kit and caboodle in the background there. And there is a reason for that because I want to look into it. I have to look into it anyway, because look at all this, all this weeds growing in here. That's just nonsense. But it's been three years since I've had it in this setup. And why not give it a little bit of a refresh? It wasn't on my list of emergencies, things I have to do ASAP. But seeing as this Care Collab video has come along, why not have a look-see together? So because of my dry top layer, I add sphagnum moss around the top to somehow give the roots a good start and not desiccate the moment they touch the lecker. And it seems to have worked because look, I've got roots going down. I did not have many roots when I got this orchid, but she has lifted herself up out of the rim of the pot. You can see how low I had her with her where the lecker is. But there must be roots in that pot because she's much higher than what I remember. Also, as part of the care thing, you can see that her reservoir is rather empty. Paphiopedums like to be a little bit on the drier side. Today would have been her flushing day, and I'm just putting it all into one care collab, flushing day, check the roots. Works for me much better this way. But let's see if it's true. Oh, ho, ho, how she has lifted herself out of the pot. Check this out. Wowzers. And yeah, true to form, the top ones are dried out. So partially worked, partially didn't. And I've got lots of other little roots going on in the pot from other ferns and the like that I've pulled over the past years. Don't want them growing in my pot. So we can get rid of those, but this is very, very promising. I'm happy. Very glad to see how well these roots have done, how long they are. Perfect, perfect. Now, I do wish I had a long, deep pot to pot her up in, but I don't. So we'll have to see what we're going to do pot-wise. I'd like to put her back in the same pot. Clearly, she it worked there. You can see the old bark. Let me come a little bit closer. You can see the old bark that I never took off because I don't want to damage the velamen from a root that was there when it arrived. This little root did not make it, so we can snip that off. That's a soft one. Very fuzzy little roots, but like any other orchid roots. There is a velamen outside. This is the actual root. But you see, it's no substance in there whatsoever. So that is okay. I mean, you know, every root is precious and I don't want to sound like I'm not grateful. But I, you know, I don't want to lose roots. But hey, I managed to grow some even with that sphagnum around the top and extend some. I have to be very careful because I don't want to damage this kink. But they're looking all right. And all I do with this one is just every once in a while, I give it a flush with plain RO water and then seaweed to boot. Sometimes I leave the reservoir empty and just the microfiber damp because Paphiopedalums like it a little bit on the drier side. Now, yes, I am spraying and the base and all that, which is kind of concerning for me because I always 
flash heavily and I have to be careful. I have lost paths because of the water going into the crown here. And I don't want to do that today. I don't want to risk it, but really please. Yeah, so I just flush. I leave the reservoir dry during the winter, microfiber damp, and the flushing is what provides me with the moisture for the plant. Fertilize I do every once in a while, but then after two or three days on the next flush, I remove the fertilized water from the reservoir and then I flush through and leave it at that as well. In the summer, I'm a little bit more liberal with the water in the reservoir. I do leave a little bit at the base because the evaporation is so heavy and fast. I don't want to leave her with an empty pot. They do like it drier, but they don't want to dry out. So what am I going to do here now? I'm going to clean up my pot and see if we can't fandangle her back in here and set her up for some success for the next three years. I'll be right back. Okay, we're back. So here's the thing, not much fertilizer, regular flushing every two, every two days in the summer, at least every three days or four days in the winter. And she lives directly under my beam of blurple lights because she's so tiny. She doesn't have the height to be too close to the light. Since I got her, she has grown two and a half leaves. <laughs> but how I'm trying to combat the dry top layer in order to protect the roots, I'm going to see with the pot up today if I can use Akadama instead of using sphagnum moss. Sorry, I was just looking what uh, all these additional roots. So I do normally do my loop down there in order to fill up Lekka around so that I can have... Let me get a different angle for you. Could be a little bit awkward, but I don't think it should be. But you see, normally I have a little loop in the microfiber and then I pour Lekka around it and through it to raise my wicking potential higher into the pot. The fact that it doesn't seem to make any difference whatsoever because I still had the dry top layer. I'm not going to fill in any lecker down there. I'm just making sure my microfiber is long enough to reach the reservoir. No lecker goes in at the bottom because I want the roots not to get kinked or bent. And normally you can turn the pot to get roots in, but these are quite, quite stiff. And I do not want to get a bigger pot. She doesn't need a bigger pot, even though I do want to accommodate the roots somehow without breaking them. So I think I have a good position here. I'm sorry if my hands are getting in the way. Multitasking with the path. Let's fill up with some lecker, at least get a bearing. See, I'd rather have her a little lower in the pot as opposed to raising her to the pot level. Just making sure that that one root doesn't slide up again. Because if she continues to do this with the roots, in about two or three years, she'll be lifting herself up and out again of her own accord. So a little bit lower in the pot wouldn't hurt so much. And I have rather large sized lecker because they do like it drier. So I try to work that in such a way that I use larger lecker. Let's get the leaves to sit proud of the pot. And I'm just gonna hold her down gently while I shake. Get some lecker in and around those roots. So I'm hoping that was all visible. And you can see that there's still a lot of space left. So I'm just going to continue filling up and around. And see how far I get before I consider Akadama on the top. Seeing as she's lower in the pot now, she also has more humidity around the base. But 
I think it would be really good if I got a little bit more moisture around the base just to protect for the warm temperatures that are coming. You see, my summers get to the 30s Celsius easily. Sometimes I have hot winds that come into the dining room area. I try to keep these guys indoors all year round in my dining room area, but I move them up closer to the glass shelf where they have a lot of bright light, but no direct sun for as long as the angle of the sun is that high in the sky. And I have to really watch it when that angle changes again, as I have cooked the path by not watching out and one hour later she was, her leaves were toast and she never recovered from that. So no direct sun, love the foliage, would love to keep it pristine, but definitely I go a little bit more on the highlight side than probably recommendable. But it is very difficult to find unless you are in a dark northern side of the property. And even then it is difficult to find moderate light in southern Spain during the summer. And that's why a lot of people come here because they want the sun, they want the light. So I'm just going to fill the Akadama just around the top to the base. Akadama will give me that humidity and that layer that moss would have given me as well. But I'm hoping without the degrading, without the green developing on the surface, but still, if any roots start to develop around the base of the plant, that she can find, they can find their way in without having to go and get dried out because of lack of moisture. Let's water in a little bit the Akadama. And this will be a test. I have never done this with a path before. This is the first path where I'm using Akadama as opposed to sphagnum moss. But you can see the wicking effect of the Akadama and it really holds moisture quite some time. And when I flush, I can be a little bit more gentle around the edge of the pot and let the Akadama wick the water into the center without me being the radical flusher that I am thinking that I have to go all the way to the top and flush in a very aggressive manner. This should, that's the plan anyway, this should help me get the water to the base without any issues in a much more controlled manner. That's, like I said, that's the plan. First time, we can do this on a care collab because subsequent updates will be a good thing. But having said that about the summer temperatures and light, the winter is a different ball game and she is under blurple lights continuously, eight hours a day, maybe nine if I forget to switch the lights on. I don't use a timer, but definitely eight hours a day she is under blurple lights and they are right above her, but at a safe distance from her leaves because she is so tiny. Clearly she has not bloomed for me yet. Let's hope that one day, if I haven't messed it up, we get some blooms. But in the winter, she has indoor temperatures that can go down to 14 degrees Celsius, which for me is not ideal, but it happened this year. Usually I hover around the 16 degrees Celsius mark indoors, and that's okay, especially if I'm keeping her a little bit on the drier side. I am not doing anything with regards to overwatering, flushing too heavily, around the base just this is the plan for my future flushes just here around the sides and let the akadama wick the water in towards the middle of the orchid instead of me trying to wet the leka and the sphagnum moss all the way around that's how i do flush her every two three days in the winter two days in the summer a bit of seaweed every once in a while, 40 parts per million. And that is when I flush her through, clean up the reservoir, same as with my fertilizing, 
I leave some of the seaweed water in the reservoir for the next two days. And then my next flushing cycle, I remove what is in the reservoir and I flush her again, and then just leave a little bit of runoff on the bottom. My main concern is that the microfiber never dries out. Maybe I fertilize her once a month, maybe at 300 parts per million, which sounds radical because they don't need that much. But again, that doesn't stay in the reservoir until it dries out. I go and interfere and I flush her through and then two days of 300 once a month. I'm thinking it's okay. I'm not seeing any leaf burn. So I'm thinking that that is a good little rhythm to have. If I saw leaf burn, then that would be over fertilizing. So for the sake of convenience, this works perfectly. Just do the 300 and take it out after two days. I would like to say thank you very much to Fernanda Nacimiento Orchids and Succulents and Attainable Green for letting me join in on this care collab of the Papiopadalum Delanatii. I'm glad I could get this out of the way despite the fact that it wasn't an emergency. We had a good look at the roots, which, is a, which, which works well. If anybody is in doubt regarding the self-watering or the lecker with the slipper orchids, I have lost a few because of my mistakes regarding how vigorously I flush. There shouldn't be the water coming up all the way to the lecker surface. That is what I normally do with every other orchid, all the way to the surface and let it drain. And this is a risk with these guys because of the leaf nodes, the joints at the bottom. So now I'm very much more conservative on how I flush, but I haven't backed off on how often I do so. I hope this was helpful to anybody who's interested in, of knowing how a Paphiopedalum would perform in a LECA and self-watering setup. I find it easy to grow them like that if human error can be avoided. If you have any questions that I didn't answer fully, that I wasn't too detailed about, please leave them in the comments below. I really very much appreciate the dialogue. Thank you again for this care collab, for letting me join in. Fernanda Nacimiento, Attainable Green, much appreciated. Have yourselves a wonderful day. Please stay safe and take care. Bye.